My name is Alkia Powell, and I am proud to announce that I am the new chairperson of Girls Leaps Board. I joined Girls Leaps Board about a year and a half ago. Um, I knew the work that they, they were doing was important. I had gone through the program actually with my daughter and um, I knew she had not, um, without not going through this program, wouldn't have learned what she had without Girls Leap. Um, they were so instrumental of her finding her voice. This motivated me to ensure other girls were getting the opportunity Girls Leap offered. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Raquel Sines, who is our amazing program director. Raquel is going to speak to you about Girls Leap journey towards greater gender inclusivity and how we came to realize the importance of clearly opening our program to all girls and gender expansive youth, ensuring they all have a safe place to come to build important relationships and to find their voice and to learn to defend themselves against the violence that surrounds them. I am looking forward to this discussion and we'll check back in again at the end. In the meantime, I hand it over to you, Dr. Sines. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Alkia, and thank you to all of you here in attendance today for coming to contribute to this wonderful community conversation that we'll have. And I also want to thank the High Meadows Graduate School of Teaching and Learning for supporting us in this conversation today as our Zoom host. Gender-based equity work has become a core piece of Girls Leap's commitment to our community and ensuring that the youth we serve are fully supported. As an organization, since our founding, many participants and staff of different sexual identities have felt at home. However, we realized in the last few years the need for more gender inclusivity. And this journey began very much inspired by a non-binary intern applicant who used he, him pronouns and but very much wanted to be a part of Girls Leap. And so as an organization that has focused on providing a safe place for girls and women, it was a bit of a challenging situation. Um, but through a series of restorative conversations that we held with staff members at all levels, we talked about our identities, our layered identities and understandings of gender we learned more about each other and gained a sense of the urgent need to shift our organizational practices to be more gender inclusive, particularly in thinking about ensuring that all youth in our programs feel at home. And so we hired that intern and who flourished within our program and added immeasurably to the understanding of our work. And since then, we have updated our mission and vision to include all girls and gender expansive youth implemented gender inclusivity trainings on an ongoing basis with our staff, shifted organizational role titles, and are working with the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition to build curriculum around gender identity, which will be included in our core program. However, we recognize that this is continuous work, a continuous journey, and we are committed to the long-term journey in uplifting the identities of gender expansive youth. And before I turn the mic over to Curie Q, I also want to take a moment to recognize the loss of one of our community members, Shahida De Alto, who was an important activist in the trans community in Boston, as well as a mentor to many. Shahida was killed on May 2nd in Dorchester. Shahida was a student at Simmons and trained with Girls Leap. Her work as an activist included a YouTube platform, uh, Jahida's Mission, where she posted numerous videos on transgender rights, and I'll include that in the chat. She was also a legend in the ballroom community as a member of Boston's House of Balenciaga. Tonight, before we begin this important conversation together, I ask that we just take a minute of silence to remember Jahida and honor her work.
Thank you. And I hope we'll continue to honor Jahida's legacy and the work that we do. Now I'd like to introduce the wonderful facilitators for our event this evening, Min Nguyen and Kim Topping of Kiri Q. Kim is an educator and writer with experience in nonprofit management, fundraising, and communications. Min is a creative youth worker with 13 years experience in the youth development and non-sector fields. And Min holds a BA in psychology and an MS in nonprofit management. In 2016, both Min and Kim began facilitating trainings dedicated to supporting LGBTQ plus communities in schools, nonprofits, shelters, and domestic violence agencies. And I will turn it over to both of you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, we're very excited about this event and just wanted to thank our sponsors first off, um, but just a little bit about myself and Kim. Um, our organization is called Kiri Q, and this started um, when Kim and I were both youth workers in Cambridge. We were having conversations with young girls about identity, about the media, about the messages that they were getting. And I was asked to come in to talk about gender and sexual orientation uh, with some middle school students. And uh, it just, the questions just started coming out. And we noticed that many people had lots of um, information, knowledge, assumptions, biases, and we just wanted to make a space for people to feel comfortable to have conversations. And that's how we started our, our trainings and our consulting organization. Um, Curie Q is based on this idea of kind of thinking about all the intersections of identity and oppression. Um, the, so Kiriarchy is kind of the intersections of all those powers that are and what we wanna do is we wanna try and interrupt it by asking lots of questions and unpacking some of those things that we've taken for granted, right? And so we've been doing this for the last five years now. Um, and I, I still consider myself a youth worker and I hope that um, this space will be a, you know, a, a, a space where we can talk and, and feel like we have a community together. Um, so thank you for that. I'm gonna pass it over to Kim real quick. Great. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm Kim, I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I also wanted to welcome us into the space with a land acknowledgement. So I'm gonna read this and then invite you all to share a land acknowledgement in the chat. So Min and I are both in what is now called Somerville and we acknowledge the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts First Nations people. We also acknowledge African ancestors forced migration to this land and their presence in the building of this nation. We do this because acknowledging territory shows recognition of and respect for Native and African people. It is recognition of their presence both in our past and in our present. Recognition and respect are essential elements of consciousness and anti-racist work for reconciliation and healing. So we invite you all to share land acknowledgement in the chat. This is one resource that you can use. It's native-land.ca created by indigenous folks. Um, so you can just type your town and state there and it will tell you more about the land that you occupy. And there's also a teacher's guide at the top of the website, which has some great sample language and things that you can use um, in your work. So give everyone a second to do that. And I also just wanna name that we start with land acknowledgements for a lot of different reasons, right? This is only one step, um, but we won't get a whole lot of time to talk about tonight how uh, before colonization, there are many examples of gender expansiveness across the globe, across cultures. Um, and so we want to acknowledge that in the work that we're doing with LGBTQ plus communities as well. Great. Thank you all for, for sharing. Please feel free to keep doing that. I'm just going to tell us a little bit about our agenda for tonight. We're going to talk about terms and experiences. We're going to talk about some challenges that LGBTQ youth are facing and some best practices that you all can use in your lives and also in your work, and we'll share some resources as well. So our main goal always is for you all to leave feeling more confident supporting LGBTQ plus folks. Our community has been steeped in a lot of invisibility and silence and this being a taboo topic. And so we wanna move away from that and help people build confidence in being supportive of LGBTQ plus folks. Um, so we'll do that through talking about terms and experiences, exploring the challenges and hearing experiences from young people themselves. A couple of things that we have found really helpful in these spaces, um, we call these ways of being, things that we ask everyone to kind of participate in during this conversation. So as Min said, ask questions, please ask questions, also share the knowledge that you have. There's also a lot of knowledge in this space, so please bring it into the conversation. We wanna assume best intentions that people signed up to, in this space to learn. We also wanna take responsibility for our impact. 
but for Min and I, it's our responsibility to name those moments when a term might be offensive, for example. This is a space to learn that so that we can take that back and adjust our language. So you do have permission to speak in the first draft. If you're not sure how to word something or if you're using the right terminology, that's okay. Just say it, um, share it with us, and then we can work through it together. We also don't wanna expect closure. Um, Min and I cannot speak for the entire LGBTQ plus community. So there's so much learning that you can do outside of this space. So we'll encourage you and share resources to do that. And with that, LGBTQ plus people are not a monolith. There's many ways of being LGBTQ plus. So, so much more for us to learn and explore. Okay, and then I'll pass it back to you for intros. All right, thank you. So um, I'm actually going to create um, breakout rooms for us to get to know each other a little bit in, in smaller groups. Um, I will also put into the chat our participant slides. And so this is um, something that you can use if you need to refer back to the questions, if you want any of the resources, we have also included all of the videos that we will be showing and a couple extra ones um, for you to kind of watch on your own time. And so in these first breakout rooms, if you can just introduce yourself, your name, your pronouns, um, if you're aff affiliated with an organization or who you're, or you're coming with, um, one good thing that happened from this past week. Um, and then the last question can just be a question or a curiosity you have about um, supporting LGBTQ communities or just a general question that you can start with your, with your small group. So I'm gonna create the breakout rooms. Uh, I won't have a whole lot of time um, for us to be in the rooms, but um, hopefully you'll have some time to uh, connect with somebody new today. Um, all right, Does ev is everybody able to access the slides? If you do have any problems, please let us know. You can ask for help and, and we can pop in and kind of try and help you um, in, in the breakout rooms, okay? Okay, we'll see you back in about five minutes. Okay, I think this is all of us. We're all back. Um, how are your breakout rooms? Just maybe just a quick thumbs up, a quick reaction. Yeah, um, maybe, um, can I get maybe just one or two people to come off mute to share you know, something that came up in your conversations, maybe a question that you have that you'd like to talk about today, or even just a, a really good thing that happened this week. Maybe just two people to come off mute um, and share with the whole group. Yeah, go ahead, Estelle. Oh, I was just saying that um, I, since I do interfaith work, I was on a Zoom um, with a, a local synagogue and one of the elderly women said, why does Estelle have she, her after her name? <laughs> mm -hmm. And she got a good, reasonable explanation, but that's something that, that I need to better know how to explain. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Great. And Ajani, would you like to share too? It's Ajane. Um, Ajane, I'm so sorry. You're good. Um, in the break of them, Lynn shared that she, yes, she, I was trying to remember for me, sorry. Um, she um, recently did a seven week course um, provided by the University of Florida for free that talked about ethnic and gender studies. So I found that really interesting. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for sharing. I know we don't have enough time to get to know everybody individually, um, but I, I hope you got a chance to connect with somebody new tonight. So thank you for that. I just wanted to say too, because Estelle brought up pronouns that we actually didn't explain exactly what pronouns are. So just to give people language, um, pronouns are just a replacement for people's names. So when you're not talking, you're not using their name, you're gonna use their pronouns. So how do you wanna be referred in terms of pronouns? So that's one way that you can explain it to folks. Um, that we often make assumptions about gender, but pronouns are a way that we avoid those assumptions and make sure we know what people's pronouns are. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Okay, so we are gonna jump into just a very brief, quick overview of some terms and definitions, just so that we're all on the same page. This is our friend, the gender unicorn. So how many folks are familiar with our friend, the gender unicorn? 
How many of you seen this before? I, I particularly love this as a tool for us to kind of talk about gender, sexual orientation and identity. Um, and it was created by trans young people um, for the trans community and for the broader community. Um, it is not a perfect tool by any means, but we really like to use it just because it helps the conversation get started. So I am going to start very quickly with sex assigned at birth. So, you know, when folks are pregnant, one of the first questions that people get asked is, is it a boy or a girl? And what we're actually doing is we're actually just talking about the physical body of a child, right? And so sex has everything to do with just the biology of um, your chromosomes, the way your um, primary and secondary sex characteristics might develop. Um, it has more to do with just the physical representation of who you are. It's called this sex assigned at birth because there are a couple instances where babies are born and their genitalia may be uh, what's considered not normal um, and their chromosomes might look different. Many, many intersex folks don't actually know that they're intersex for a very long time because doctors and families make a decision to raise a child in a certain way. A lot of times they also do surgery. Um, we do have a video in the participant slides um, about the intersex community. Um, it's intersex activists actually talking about their own lives, um, their challenges, and um, kind of the challenges that they have with the medical community. And so please check that out. We don't have time to show it today, but it's, it's a really wonderful um, video that we like to talk uh, to use. So sex assigned at birth, uh, sex is uh, biology, just like animals, there are male and female cats out there, there are male and female moose out there, um, but gender is a specifically uh, human thing. We have assigned a meaning, we have assigned um, roles um, that are associated with gender. And so for myself, I can use myself as an example. So I was assigned female at birth, but growing up, you know, the expectation is I'm going to grow into a girl, I'm going to grow up to be a woman, I'm going to live happily ever after. But that's, that wasn't the case when I was growing up. I felt very, very uncomfortable in my body and I didn't quite have the language to talk about it because growing up, I also didn't have conversations like this um, about identity, about gender and things like that. And it wasn't until much, much later that I found out that I, I identified more closely with being non-binary. So to me, being a gender being non-binary or being gender non-conforming, I feel a little bit of a boy, I feel a little bit of a girl, sometimes I feel both, sometimes I feel neither. So sometimes when I go out to schools uh, and I, I run into little ones, little kindergartners, they see me, um, and you can't see my full self right now, but they kind of look at me and they go, what is going on with you? Um, and they always ask, are you a boy or a girl? And what I do is I actually open up the conversation and have them answer, what do you think I am? Right, and so instead of just answering the question directly, I'm trying to um, involve folks into this conversation about what does gender actually mean? What does it look like? Um, and they always go, well, you're wearing boys clothes, which you kind of look like a girl, which your hair is like this. And I just go, sure, that's just who I am. And that this is how I like to represent myself. I'm a little bit of a boy, I'm a little bit of a girl. Most of the time, the little ones are like, that's cool. I'm gonna run off and I'm gonna live my life, right? Um, I usually typically get more pushback from people who are older who have different assumptions, different socializations, different you know, associations with gender. Um, but for little ones and, and young people, most of the time they're like, that's cool, I'm just gonna move on, right? Um, so gender identity has everything to do with how we think of ourselves. Um, so I think of myself as a non-binary person. I know people from the outside might assume that I am a, a woman um, and that just that doesn't quite jive with me. And I think there are lots and lots of folks who are finally finding safety um, in expressing their um, identities. And we have spaces for us to actually talk about these things, right? So gender expression has more to do with how you present this. So for me, like this is my hair. Um, I shop in the little boy section because I personally like those clothes. They fit me better, I save money. Um, but there are other ways of kind of thinking about expression too. There are, you know, how you cross your legs, how you refer to yourself, the people you choose to hang out with, um, how you uh, like to take up space or not. All of these things are kind of associated with a lot of this uh, gender stereotypes that are out there. If feminine, masculine, other. There are some folks out there who are gender fluid who might feel very feminine one day and more masculine the next day. And it might fluctuate within the day, it might fluctuate within the week, it might fluctuate within the span of their lifetime, right? Um, so those gender identity, gender expression, every single person in here has their own kind of map of this. And I like to use this uh, gender unicorn as a, um, an example of, you know, those video games where you get to create a character and you get to slide certain things to be like your hair is this long or your height is this. 
every single person in this um, training today, in this uh, conversation, this event today, um, probably has a different kind of map of how they feel today. Um, this may change over time for some people and for some other people, it doesn't change at all. And that's okay, right? And so the best practice here is also just to, to ask folks, um, what does that mean for you, right? If I say I'm non-binary, the best practice is just to say, what does that mean for you? Because I can ask a number of different folks in the room and they might have a different definition. Um, this is especially true when we start thinking a little bit about sexual orientation. The term bisexual, right, may mean one thing to somebody and it might, might mean something completely different to someone else. The other thing to keep in mind is also to remember that however folks identify, we're gonna just honor that identity at base value, even if we know a little bit more about what's going on in their behavior and other things that we know about them, how they identify is how we're gonna kind of address them, right? This is especially true for um, youth, right? If they say, I think I'm bisexual, um, but they, or let, let's use the, the one, um, let's say a young person says, I uh, identify as a lesbian, but they may be dating a boy at the time. Um, that doesn't negate their identity and we're gonna honor that identity and just kind of move forward. They might be questioning it. They might be in flux. Um, they might not feel safe yet to also identify with certain other identities, right? Um, and so um, the last piece is just about sexual orientation. It's divided into physical attraction and also emotional attraction because there are some people out there who might have differences in who they're physically attracted to versus who they're emotionally attracted to. I don't have a whole lot of time to, to dive deeper into this, um, but if folks do have questions, I'm more than happy to stay after um, if you'd like to chat uh, a little bit more on it. Okay, so we also have a, a number of different terms um, that are kind of related to each of these five different dimensions of identity. Um, and again, for a very, very long time of our human history, the assumption was if you were assigned male at birth, you would grow up to be a boy, you would grow up to be a man, you would marry a woman happily ever after, right? And I think that the conversations that are happening is that's not always the case anymore for folks and we can't assume that we know anything just based on how they look, based on their pronouns, based on anything really, right? And so um, the complexity of gender and um, sexual orientation is kind of why we're here today, right? We, we actually have language, we actually have space and we have a little bit more safety to, to dive into some of these um, aspects of identity. Okay, I'm gonna pause here just for a second. Does anybody have um, a burning question about any of these identities? I know this is a lot. I know uh, I'm going fairly quickly, but if, if anybody has any questions. Okay. Kim, did you want to jump in real quick? No? Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, go over just a couple trans specific uh, terms just to, to kind of think about. So, transgender is when the sex assigned at birth doesn't line up with how your gender identity is. So, for myself, I was assigned female at birth. I don't identify as a woman or a girl. So, that means that I am part of the trans community. Um, if, you, if your sex assigned at birth does align with your um, gender identity, that is cisgender. So if you, you are um, assigned female at birth, you grow up to be a woman, that is a cisgender person. And we use this term cisgender just so that we're not kind of naming transgender as one thing and then normal as the other, right? There's, there are different terms to make sure that everybody's on the same kind of playing field. Um, so Kim already mentioned a little bit about pronouns, right? So pronouns has everything to do with how we identify ourselves. It's just as important as names. Um, and that's why we identify or introduce ourselves often with using our names and our pronouns because later on somebody might be able to refer to us. They can say Min and Kim did this training. They said this about pronouns or they said this about identity, right? Um, and we want to make sure that this is, is um, pretty important. We have a, a point later on that says that pronouns are actually the number one thing that we can do um, if we are using the correct name and pronoun that people choose that has more benefits for everybody than almost anything else. More than surgery, more than hormones, more than um, getting therapy sometimes too. So the next point is uh, transition. So there are a number of people out there who choose to socially transition, meaning that they might choose a new name, they might choose new pronouns, um, and they identify as uh, part of the trans community, but they are not interested in, in um, maybe getting any of the, the medical um, the medical procedures that might align with um, being trans. So there are a number of people out there who do, are looking for a medical transition, but many times um, this requires a lot of access. This requires access to health. It requires access to 
money and requires access to safety to be able to um, get some, some surgeries or some hormones. And this doesn't diminish um, anybody's identity, right? If somebody chooses to just socially transition, that doesn't mean that they're any less trans than if they do get some surgeries and vice versa. And I just wanted to put that one out there. And then the last one is just the dead name. So um, this is for particularly true for trans people who choose a different name, um, choose their real name, right? Um, a dead name is something that they were assigned at birth also, right? If we think about um, names, we don't choose those names that we're given. And so for trans people, when they're transitioning, they don't wanna be associated with the dead name. And so that can also be very mentally um, taxing for folks. And so just to make sure that you're using the correct name and pronouns um, for folks however they choose to identify, right? And then these three terms on the right, um, Latinx, Latin um, is to refer to um, an inclusive community in, um, it, it used to be called Latino, Latina, right? And they're using Latinx or Latin to be more gender inclusive. This is a, an evolving conversation that is actually happening every single day. Um, there are some people who like to use Latinx as an inclusive term. And there's other people who feel like Latin is more natural for the, the language structure of, of um, Spanish, right? Um, and I, I'd also just like to plug that, you know, these conversations are, are ever evolving. Like in my native language, um, pronouns are very complex. Um, there are different pronouns for folks based on their age or their relationship to you. And they are very gendered, right? And so I actually just learned about a new Vietnamese term that is gender neutral to talk about an older sibling. And it's actually just a mashup of the other words. Um, but again, this is a, a, a new conversation that's happening. It's rapidly evolving, um, but we just wanted to put that one out there. So QT, uh, B, uh, B -I -P -O -C is queer, trans, black, indigenous, people of color. And so you might see this term um, more commonly now, um, but we just wanted to kind of name that out there just to be sure that we are honoring and um, prioritizing the queer and trans, black and indigenous folks who have done a lot for the community um, that are often very forgotten when we're just thinking about the POC community, right? Or if just thinking about the LGBTQ community. Um, a lot of times uh, we just wanna make sure that they are um, prioritized and remembered first. And two-spirit is the last term. Um, this is a term that some indigenous communities may use to kind of think about folks who embody um, aspects of masculinity and femininity within them. This isn't true for all indigenous communities, um, but it is um, sometimes used uh, to kind of talk about a person who um, had a different kind of status, a different kind of role within um, their communities and things like that. Okay, Kim, did I miss anything? Would you like to? jump in. No, I don't think so. I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts or questions. I saw a comment in the chat about evolving conversation is a really important concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to highlight again, uh, use compassion. If folks are identifying in any type of way, you're just going to ask if you have that kind of relationship with them. What does that mean to you? Do you mind telling me a little bit more? Um, I'd love to learn. Um, and then the other one is also just to make sure that we're not placing identities on other people. I know it's very, very common and very natural for us to do so because we're human, right? That's just a normal thing. I'm going to look at this person. I'm going to try and guess what I know about them to not offend them. And and that's just part of um, meeting new people, right? And so um, just to make sure that you're um, identifying folks how they like to be identified, let them determine that. And then you just kind of um, correct yourself very briefly and then move on, okay? These are just a number of flags we like to highlight because flags are important. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Are we moving too quickly? Okay. All right. Yeah, we're going to move on to a couple of videos and then we'll open it up to conversation for you all. Um, so the first video is from a, a former school nurse talking about her experience. The next video is from uh, two students. Oops. My name is Opal Heinz Fisher and I currently work at Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. 
I started at Madison Park a number of years ago as the school nurse, and that's when I became involved with our Gay Street Alliance. The students would come to my office, a number of students who are identifying with one gender or the other. For example, the girls um, who phenotypically look like fellas and they wanted to use the bathroom. Well, to go into the girl's bathroom at the time when her dress, her hair, her manner was that of a boy, at some point she was uncomfortable, so she would use the nurse's bathroom. Um, and then one thing led to another, and before you know it, I was asked to be the advisor for the girl of the Gay Straight Alliance. What's important for us, I think, in terms of nurses is to be a safe haven for whomever comes into the nurse's office allowing the student and or faculty to feel comfortable to express themselves for whomever they are. And at no time should we express whatever one's personal bias. I always tell my nursing students, I don't really care what you believe. I don't care what you're thinking because we're here to support the patient that's in front of us. And so at no time did I question what any one of my students and or faculty um, in terms of their orientation, but I needed for them to feel safe, to feel comfortable. I served as an advocate for them when advocacy was needed. For example, when students were homeless as a result of coming out to their parents, some of the abuse that they experienced. I, for example, was the sounding board. I would hear it and then be able to take it to administration and be able to share what others were saying for those that didn't feel comfortable using their own voice. I think it's important that all educators, school personnel recognize our responsibility to serve whomever is in front of us. I think as a school nurse, it's imperative that we understand the importance of our voice and our position and our role within the school community as well as within the greater community. From the perspective of a nurse, of a mom, of a wife, of a sister, of an aunt, I say to folks that it is so important for us to understand what children are going through, what youngsters are going through. School can be very, very challenging. I'm not speaking in terms of the academics and the nuances of the competitiveness. Fitting in is so very important. Imagine we could save someone's baby by being there, by being supportive, by being respectful, by being nurturing, because I could never ever live with myself if somebody were to hurt themselves because of something I did or did not do. I think of all those poor children that died because of the teasing and the bullying and just the, the, the horrible, horrible things that have happened to them because of their sexual orientation. And I say enough is enough. teacher that I had up until just this year. Her name was Miss Jardine. And when I realized I was bi, it was kind of a hard time for me. And I didn't talk about it for a really long time. I kind of kept it inside. And I would mention it. And I would just kind of get told like, oh, like, you're still figuring yourself out. Um, and one day, my choir teacher was talking to me. And I had said, I don't know, something about maybe having a crush or something like that. And she was like, oh, is he cute? And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's kind of, it's a girl. And she was like, oh, is she cute? And she just took it and she ran with it. And it wasn't one of those moments where you just stop everything and there's a giant elephant in the room. She just took it and she ran with it because she knew I wasn't any different. Just because my I had stated what my sexuality was. This tuck it has just... She's been really great at just standing by me and not only in the classroom, but when I'm not in the classroom and when she's talking with other students or other educators um, in the administration. And she's done that not only for me, but for other trans students um, at my school, which is something that is hard to navigate, especially going to a traditional single gendered school um, and identifying as something not on the female um, side of the spectrum. Okay, so what did you all think? What were some examples of support that you heard in the videos? You can use the chat or unmute. Just so we can really name what those examples of support were. What were some things that you heard? 
Uh, this is Anne. Um, I was just going to say that it was just amazing listening to that nurse talk about it because it wasn't just about the moment. It was about the bigger picture too of um, really supporting, recognizing that it's not just the moment, but it's so much more than that and, and how important this is in the lives of these students and, and, um, and staff there at her school. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Hi there, this is Shalea. Um, I really appreciated hearing from the students, um, the last student who just spoke. Um, I like the fact that she they felt supported um, individually by the teacher, but also the teacher made sure that they would have conversations with other people, mm -hmm. um, kind of be an ally to that too. I thought that was really important. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Shalea. Yeah, that stood out to me when I first saw this too. It's not just about when a trans student is in the classroom, it's also what hap what is happening otherwise. When the trans student is not around, are you actually interrupting those microaggressions or sticking up for them in those moments? So absolutely, yeah. Anyone else? I see a lot of great comments in the chat. Hi, what about the second question, bringing it into either your personal life or the work that you do what are some examples of ways that spaces that you're a part of might be either consciously or unconsciously gendered? So this might be something like lining up girls and boys in school or grouping girls and boys in school. Um, and how, how might spaces also be heteronormative? So an example of this is like when you're meeting um, a young person for the first time and you say, oh, can you tell me about mom and dad at home? That assumes that there's a heter heterosexual relationship at home. Um, and it also erases the many different types of families, right? Someone might be raised by one parent or by a grandparent or another family member. Um, so how can we be more expansive with how we think about families too? So what do you think about that? What, what's coming up in your lives or your spaces? Yeah, Alkia, go ahead. So, I mean, it's interesting that you say like, you know, um, assuming someone's sexuality or if they have uh, uh, two parents, if they have two mommies or two daddies. And, you know, my daughter goes to a very diverse school um, right now, uh, Beaver Country Day. And mm. she actually has taught me a lot because, I mean, there was a lot of ignorance on my end. I just really didn't know. I was just calling everyone she, he, and she's like, no, that's they. I was like, huh? I, like I was completely lost. And I was, so she, you know, it became, she actually turned it into a more um, uh, conversational comedy skit for me. Cause she was like, so nice. what are you feeling like today, mommy? And I was, I was like, I think I'm feeling like they, you know, cause she was saying, she explained to me that you could be anything that you want and no one's going to judge you. And I was like, how is that possible? Mm. Um, but what today's age, it really is. And to be comfortable and to leave the bias out of it um, and not assume like, you know, an older generation. And I, I consider myself part of that generation. We tend to assume. But then I have so many gay friends that they're even the older ones are confused with some of the pronouns and how to use them. So they crack me up as well. So it's just like, you know, trying to adjust and get used to this new norm is what I call it. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And naming your own learning. And also like we always try to acknowledge too, that there's, there's bias across every community or age group or whatever you want to um, label, right? There's bias everywhere. And there's also acceptance and learning and um, love that's happening as well. So my, yeah. My tends to give me heads up if, you know, one of her friends, she was like, they refer to themselves as they, she'll tell me in advance. So um, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's easy for me. I was like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you won't have that moment of kind of making a mistake or using the wrong pronouns, but even if you did, like, that's okay too. And that's a moment to correct ourselves for sure. Thank you. I this is Anne. I was just going to say too that I've noticed that um, forms that um, gender that say female or male that mm -hmm. there's not an opportunity to, um, and I think that that's just people haven't thought about it, and so um, it, it forces people to choose something that they may not fit them, and um, people just don't realize how how difficult that can be for someone who is non-binary or who's transgender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that moment of having to choose, right, and not even having an option there. I've definitely been there 
we're not really going to talk about organizational policies tonight, but that's definitely a big one, right? Thinking about your forms and what options are there. We just suggest a blank line, right? Leaving it open, giving people space to identify however they need to. Um, right. All right. Real quick, two seconds. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Also thinking about guardians, right? Instead of saying parents, mm -hmm. because sometimes uh, not everybody lives with parents. And then the other thing is, I know, because I work in a gendered uh, organization, Strong Women, Strong Girls, um, a lot of our language was... Um, she, daughter, and you can just change that to just child, right? And that's a very simple find replace. And, and that takes the genderedness out of it and it makes it way more inclusive. Um, just a quick plug for that piece. Yeah, thanks, Men. Um, we're gonna jump ahead to some of the challenges that young people are facing. And, and you heard Opal talking about this. So we know that LGBTQ young people, and I've experienced this myself, um, face a lot of different challenges around uh, mental health and attempting suicide or considering suicide um, and many, many other things. And the Youth Risk Behavior Survey in Massachusetts, which happens every two years, now includes LGBTQ students. And you can see that they're facing all these kind of health risk behaviors at much higher rates than other students. Um, and really what it boils down to is because of the way society treats LGBTQ people. There's nothing inherently wrong with LGBTQ youth, um, it's the society that is responding to them um, often with a lack of acceptance, whether that's from family or school or somewhere else. So Min named this earlier, but using chosen names for trans people particularly really reduces those odds of depression and suicide. So things like that, names, pronouns, also having one for young people, having one supportive adult really makes a huge difference. Um, and in terms of family acceptance, we always talk about this as being a continuum. It's a, a process for family members, right? We don't expect like family members, as soon as a, a young person is opening up to them and sharing their sexuality or their gender identity to immediately be fully understanding what matters is that, that there is love and acceptance in that relationship. And that's where there sometimes needs to be some really intentional work. If a family member has never met a trans person before, we need to introduce that family member to a trans person so that they can learn more about that experience and not do all of that learning on the child, right? Because that's a lot to take on. Um, so these are just two organizations, Family Acceptance Project and PFLAG that do work with families, especially the Family Acceptance Project has more culturally responsive materials um, in a lot of different languages. And I know that they're working to expand that more. So these are great organizations to reach out to for connecting with families. Okay, we're gonna take a quick trivia break. Um, and just ask and, and invite folks to name a historic LGBTQ person or an event. Um, and we wanted to highlight this just in terms of uh, representation. Like I mentioned, growing up, I didn't have any of these conversations. Um, I actually didn't know how uh, queer I actually was until I got into college because I didn't have conversations. And I grew up in a very um, religious, traditional type family. Um, or we just didn't have these conversations. And so I didn't know what I could be or who I could be growing up. And um, at the time, I'm dating myself, but I didn't have lots of uh, TV shows. There wasn't media, there weren't out celebrities or out um, pol politicians to kind of be role models for, for myself. Um, and so I, I'm just inviting folks to just, um, if you'd like to come off mute, just you can name somebody, you can throw it in the chat, you can name an event um, that folks should probably know about. Um, we do have a, a couple of videos about um, LGBTQ or trans history in your participant slides. Uh, one of them is animated and narrated by... Um, oh Laverne God. Cox. Yes, Laverne yeah. Cox. Uh, it's narrated by her and I think it's uh, illustrated by trans folks. It's a really wonderful um, video and I highly um, encourage you all to, to watch it. It's really great. Yeah, there's some really great Names, Stonewall Riots, Harvey Milk, Audre Lorde, I'm gonna skip over Ellen, RuPaul, um, Billy Porter, James Baldwin, Sarah Ramirez. Yeah, lots of really, really fantastic folks. Um, if you have any recommendations for media that folks could, should check out, please throw that in there. There's a really wonderful documentary about trans folks called Disclosure that's on Netflix. Um, it's really, really wonderful. Um, I highly encourage you to check that one out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah, Alan Turing, there are lots of folks in there. I think we also have, have a couple of um, examples in your participant slides too. And again, this has everything to do with um, 
how you imagine yourself as a young person, right? If you had been introduced to, to queer folks in science, in history, in math, um, growing up, I think many people's lives would be very different, right? Until you get to see somebody um, that you want to be like. Um, uh, you know, there, there are lots of um, opportunities for folks to kind of build um, these role models into curriculum and to bring them up into conversation or just to have like a current events. Like, did you hear about Elliot Page? Let's talk about him a little bit, right? There are lots of ways to just kind of connect with folks and start the conversation. It doesn't have to be a whole, this is my whole lesson plan for the semester. It can just be little snippets of, I see you, I see the community, I, I'm here for you, right? Yeah, these are really, really fantastic. I'm gonna to have to save the, the chat um, to do some of my own research later, right? Dr. Rachel Levine, yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, so this next slide is just a, um, a strategy for when harmful language might be happening around you, near you, especially uh, with young people. Um, so we are going to focus this on kind of homophobic or transphobic comments, but this does definitely apply to other identities, other forms of um, verbal uh, um, harm that are happening around you. And so if young people are kind of teasing each other, saying boys don't do this, or um, you should man up, right? Those are very harmful messages that could be thrown around. Um, and the, the easiest way to do this is one, to stop it. Um, name the behavior that's just happening. We're not gonna be calling each other names. We're not gonna um, try and force gender stereotypes on folks. Um, we're gonna claim it, meaning you're gonna try and tie the, the harm that's being said to yourself, right? I don't like that kind of language around me because it makes the space unsafe. And then you're gonna maybe ask a question if you have time um, to kind of ask, where did you learn that from? Let's unpack where you've got those ideas. Um, so as a youth worker, this definitely happens you know, fairly often, um, but I also hope that many people are already doing this. You're already stopping harmful language, you're already naming why it's wrong. I think the one, the technique that I learned um, more recently is claiming it, making sure that I'm tying myself to the situation. And you don't have to be part of the community to, you know, advocate for somebody. If somebody is making um, harmful comments about the Muslim community, I'm not part of that community, but I can still say, I think that language is really harmful and it's making the space not safe. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's see what we can do differently or where did you get those ideas from um, so that we can start to unpack. Um, I've also done this uh, with complete strangers sometimes. Um, I know this is a little bit more risky. It's a little harm, um, potentially uh, dangerous, but if you feel safe enough, you can interrupt bad behavior. I, I've definitely done this when I, I hear language out in the world and I go, that's just not very nice. Um, and and I'll, I'll just say it out loud because I think that bad behavior should be called out when it's happening, if you feel safe to do that. Yeah, and, and it absolutely is very hard with family because it's, it's um, there's a lot of layers there when it comes to kind of interrupting harmful behaviors with family. Um, that's a whole nother training. <laughs> we'll have to do that another day. Okay. So we are going to go into um, inclusive language. I know there's been a lot of chat um, about language and how it's very gendered um, and how it's very subtle, um, but it's there everywhere, right? And so we're just going to uh, kind of introduce a couple things, a couple strategies. So the first one is this very, very adorable puppy, uh, right? When we're out on the street and we see a very cute puppy, sometimes we go, oh my God, he's so cute. And then the owner might say, this is actually a female dog what happens? Most of the time he goes, oh my God, she's so cute. And then just move on, right? This is the exact same with pronouns. We don't have to make it into a big deal. We don't have to apologize profusely. We don't have to bend over backwards to make it really uncomfortable. All you have to do is just actually thank them. So this is a newer technique that I've um, only um, been using for the last couple of years is to thank somebody when they're correcting us, right? Um, because if you're saying sorry, you're kind of like putting the onus on somebody else to say it's okay when really it's not okay. And thanking somebody is just to kind of welcome them in and say, thank you for correcting me. That's okay, we're gonna move on, right? So that's just one. Um, the, and this is part of the chat that we've already been talking about, thinking about gendered language, when it's happening, when it's subconscious, when it's just your knee jerk reaction, right? Um, I know many people in elementary schools used to say, boys and girls, we're gonna line up, boys over here, girls over here. And that was very, very common, very normal. Um, but uh, part of this 
um, part of our work has been to kind of start to get people to think about it. Think about when you are using gendered language, is it the most important way to do this? Um, does it have to be gendered, right? Um, I can just welcome everybody, welcome folks. Um, there are lots of other ways to use um, inclusive words for the group, folks, everyone, y'all. Um, we don't have to say ladies and gentlemen, you can just say welcome distinguished guests. Um, and other, other terms around inclusive language, just around kids too, right? Um, I was told by some young people that please don't call me a kid. I'm not a child and I'm not a baby goat. And so now I am very intentional about making sure that I call young people, young people, youth. Um, you can use friends, you can use scholars. I know we have a number of schools that like to use the term scholars instead of students. I think it elevates um, their status. It's, it just kind of like puts them in a different kind of light. The language you use has everything to do with how you think about people, right? And so just to be more mindful, it's going to be very hard, right? I, I use the term guys all the time, right? Hey, you guys, uh, how are you guys doing, right? But we want it to be less of a knee-jerk reaction, less of a, because sometimes using the term guys might not be inclusive for everybody, just as with ladies, right? If anybody refers to me as part of the ladies, I go, that's so weird. That's just not who I am, right? And so just to be a little bit more mindful of when we're using umbrella terms to refer to groups of people, when that may or may not be the case for everybody, right? Um, and we've already talked about, you know, significant others, um, you know, you can talk about partners, significant others, their family, um, you don't have to use it in such a, a gendered way. And the expectation is, again, not to just be like, you're going to completely wipe out all of your gendered language tomorrow, snap, it's that easy. It's not that easy, right, because it's a lot of socialization we have to kind of unlearn. And sometimes we just want you to just say, you know, like, have a moment, have a quick pause of like, oh, I, I use this term, maybe I should think about working on, on using a different term. And then this uh, next one is just, if folks are coming out to you, we want you to match their energy. Um, so if a young person is, you know, kind of quiet, kind of reserved about coming out to you, you just want to, you don't want to overblow your reaction to it um, and just try and make sure that um, however they're telling you is how you're going to respond appropriately. And then the other thing is also to think about confidentiality. So this has a lot to do with safety. I'll let Kim actually tell this story if you feel comfortable. Yeah, sure. I was also going to add something I learned recently, which is instead of coming out, we're inviting people in. Um, so it has a more positive connotation because if someone's coming out to you, they are trusting you, right? The, if they're telling you that they really trust you and want to share that moment with you. So they're inviting you in to their life rather than coming out kind of sounds like shameful. They're telling you something that should be secretive, right? That's not what sexuality and gender is. Um, so that's something I learned recently that was really helpful. Um, in my experience growing up, I came out when I was uh, 12 years old in middle school and I had really supportive uh, friends and some teachers at school. And I was talking to a guidance counselor and then I finally came out to my family and it was really hard, um, went a lot worse than I really expected. And um, my guidance counselor talked to my family the next day and told them that I was going through a phase and that I could be changed. And that was very much in line with what my family had learned growing up. And it just kind of made it worse for me at home and more unsafe. Um, so that's really a lot, a lot of what we talk about with educators and administrators is around confidentiality. If a young person shares something with you, that's confidential information. And again, it's an honor that they trust you that much to share that with you. And they're trusting that you're going to hold that and help them be safe with that information. Um, so confidentiality is just a really huge piece of this, especially working with young people. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and so an easy way to do this with young people if they are coming out to you maybe for the first time is just asking who knows about this and who can I tell mm -hmm. or who can I talk to about this? Um, would you prefer that I use this pronoun or name here? And would you prefer me to use a different name or pronoun at home with your family, right? And just kind of checking in with the young person because they'll, they'll know um, what's most safe for them. Um, and we want, just want to make sure that um, young people are safe and that we're protecting them as much as we possibly can. Okay, 
So we're actually going to um, go into another breakout room where we get to just kind of reflect on a lot of this. I know we're moving fairly quickly. Um, this is also in your participant slides, um, but just to, if you'd like to just have a conversation, you don't have to do the notes. Um, I can also put the Jamboard in here. How many folks are familiar with Jamboards? Have you ever used them before? It's a really cool Google tool that we've used as just like a group way to kind of get to um, a group process. Um, and so I can, Kim, I don't know if you wanna just demo it really quickly. Do you mind? So you should be able to click on this link. Everybody should be able to pop into this Jamboard. Um, and over here on the left, there are a couple of different options. You can draw, you can write. There are sticky notes um, that you can also use to kind of put um, your thoughts in here on what you're thinking about right now or what you're feeling or an action item that you'd like to take with you. Um, kind of moving forward, you can throw in pictures if you'd really like. Um, I am a big fan of memes. Um, if anybody else wants to use a meme to throw into some of these, that's fantastic. Um, and then also text boxes if you would like. Okay, any questions? before we go into breakout rooms. No, we're all okay? All right. So we're gonna send you all off into breakout rooms. Please take the time to just kind of chat with each other. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Um, and if you have any questions so that um, we can maybe address them in the last couple minutes of um, our time together. Okay, we'll see you in a bit. Part of the conversation I think is like, how do we create, girls spaces are still not safe. And then how we create a new space to also hold safe girl spaces and the need for people who are exploring their gender identity at the same time. So we're really talking about changing very cultural norms that are not funded. And how do we make sure that there's the funding and the support to both make uh, girls, however you define yourself, people, however you define yourself, um, having spaces to be safe. Mm -hmm. Lynn, did that capture it okay? Um, yes, I would say the important thing is that we are offering a safe space for people who need it. And um, uh, the one thing I will say about um, Girls Leap is we have gone through our programming or our, in our changes. Um, I'll be honest, I was a little bit worried about um, the, uh, much of the funding that we get that is from organizations that specifically support um, girls groups. And honestly, we have not had any pushback whatsoever in this space. Everyone is very open and welcoming and, and happy that people are figuring it out, frankly. So yeah. that's, that's the good news. That's you know, really good like, to hear. That's good uh, to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say Raquel and Cynthia were very, you know, strong on it's the right thing to do when we're doing it. And um, you know, as was I, but I was, like I said, I was nervous about the funding, but um, I'm really pleased that people are coming along. Yeah, that's really Thank important you. to hear because, because programs like Teen Voices and Girls Radio, which were small early spaces for this work, didn't survive financially. So, so there, we need to figure out those lessons for smaller programs that may need different kinds of support. Yeah, yeah. thank you both for sharing. Um, Min and I were actually just talking with earlier today too, uh, is historically girls serving organization, how they have transformed their mission statement and the work that mm -hmm. they do. And there's so many other organizations in the Boston area who are doing the same thing. Um, so there's a lot of support there. And regardless, it's, it's so needed so we can support our right. non-binary and trans young people. So thank you. Right. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share from your groups before we wrap up? Mm, yeah, the evolution from women's studies to gender studies. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Awesome. Okay, well, we can end on some resources. So there's a whole lot, um, but I just wanted to point out a couple here. So the, the first one I want to highlight is actually Boston Public Schools. I know there are some folks who are connected with Boston Public Schools. It is incredible that they, in this past year, have hired an LGBTQ student support manager whose name is DJ Rock. 
um, who also works with Elijah. They're a team and they are focused on LGBTQ student support. So everything that we do in Boston and the Safe Schools program does in Boston, we partner with DJ and Elijah on that now that they are really focused on that in Boston public schools. Um, so I'd really encourage you to reach out to them uh, for anyone who has connection with PPS. And then of course, some folks who were involved with tonight, MTPC, they offer a lot of support to folks in the community, especially legal support, things like um, name change documentation. Uh, they were the lead on advocating for public accommodations for trans people, the Yes on Three campaign, which if you weren't familiar with that, I really encourage you to check it out. Amazing grassroots organizing. Bagley has so many different programs for young people, um, has been serving the community for decades now. And then there's a couple other here, uh, Trans Lifeline and the Trevor Project. They have 24 hour hotlines. You can call and text and chat. So those are a great resource, especially for folks um, with, uh, you know, might have mental health concerns or considering suicide. These are really supportive resources that you can direct people to, especially when they're in a crisis. Um, and Glad Answers similarly has a hotline, text and chat and call if you have legal questions that you're looking for answers to. And they're, they have a really supportive team there and can support you in finding those answers. And the Trans Emergency Fund is here in Boston. It's led by Chastity Bowick. They're trying to open the first shelter for trans people in Boston. Um, so of course, there's a lot of fundraising that goes into that. So that's a great organization to support as well and reach out if you are looking for resources for trans people. Okay, I'll pass it back to Alkia. Wow. Thank you so much um, to all of you who attended and contribute to this conversation. Um, I, I've learned so much. I hope you learned something new and that, you know, you, you personally um, move this conversation forward in your home and your workspace and your community. Um, I would like to send a warm and special thank you to me, Kim, Simmons University, Mass G Transgender Political Coalition, and Bagley, without whom this program could never have happened. Um, we would love to hear from all of you who participated tonight um, and know that, know what more you uh, like to explore on this topic or other topics on gender, race, and cultural equities. Uh, these topics are critical and to our youth we serve and we intend to keep the conversation going. So this will not be the end. And of course, if you would like to learn more about Girls Leap, we've talked about a number of our programs dissolving. Um, please go to www.girlsleep.org and consider donating anything, any small amount is welcomed. Um, we wanna keep this program going strong. And I just wanna say thank you to you all and I guess we can, you know, leave on a good note. Yes, thank you. Uh, like I said, we are more than happy to stick around for a little bit. Please email us if you have any questions or would like us to do a more targeted uh, training or we can go more in depth with organizational policies um, for nonprofits or for uh, youth organizations. So please, thank you so much. Um, it was great to see you all and thank you for um, having this conversation. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Great. This was really terrific. Great work, ladies. Thank yes. you. Women. <laughs> People. Thank you, Marie. Great to hear you <laughs> and have you Good with to us. Be involved. Take good care. <laughs>